Hi folks, mini bike sprocket. Daniel was one of our college summer interns. He did a great job. And one of the things he wanted to do was make a sprocket for his mini bike. And I absolutely love seeing young people who are passionate and want to learn the trade. And one of the things I will say is being able to make your own part that you can figuratively and literally carry with you, show it in a job interview and gain that confidence is absolutely huge. So let's walk through how Daniel did this on his own, his first summer ever running CNC machines. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. For folks that have machined parts before, you know that machining parts usually isn't that difficult. It's holding on to them that's really a pain in the butt. And that's one of the things that we absolutely love about the super glue technique. This is an eight inch by eight inch by three eighths inch piece of aluminum. So it's a pretty darn big plate relative to its thickness. It would definitely chatter if you tried to clamp it between edges. It's also three eighths of an inch thick because that happens to be the stock that we have on hand. The first thing we have to do is machine it down just under a quarter of an inch. Grabbing a Saunders mini pallet, decking it off just to make sure it's a clean face free of burrs and square to the spindle. Putting down some tape, some super glue, and we're off to the races. Superfly. 2,500 RPMs or just shy of 2,000 surface feet a minute, 45 inches per minute, which is six thousandths of an inch feet per tooth. It's moving with a 75 thou maximum step down. No problem at all uh, on the work holding here from the super glue technique, which is, just makes me smile. It's awesome. After Daniel started working on the cam, he said, can I use these bolt holes as a way to fixture on op two? And so first of all, awesome, absolutely. That's one of the key lessons in life is don't just ask, propose, think, take that next step. So we're spotting these holes, then we'll drill them out with a quarter inch drill bit. And again, by having it on a block of aluminum, it doesn't have to be one of the mini pallets that we make. It could be a, a scrap piece. You're able to drill all the way through, but you're also able to maintain support. You're not having deflection from the tool pressure of that drill pushing down on this relatively thin part and causing it to flex. Now the next step is very much subjective. It's what your personal preference and personal style is. And Daniel had originally done an adaptive that went into every nook and cranny, but it's relatively slow because you've got a quarter inch tool going into a slightly larger than quarter inch area slot. And that's okay, we weren't really in a rush here, but this is an example of where I love drills. Drills are a phenomenal way to remove material. They tend to be inexpensive, they tend to be very reliable, and you can actually push them pretty hard. So in this case, we're using a 5 16th inch twist drill, 180 surface feet per minute, 6,000 feet per rev, straight through, no pecking. And we're able to quote unquote rough all of those sprocket teeth out in just under two and a half minutes. But here's the thing, take a look at that drill location. It's not actually tangential to the inside of that sprocket. And in fact, if you take a really close look, the drill is slightly too large to even do so. So what we did, we hopped back into the CAD environment, expand our sketches, and turn our drill sketch back on. We're using a point that's slightly wider or outside of the center of this circle. Let's show how we did that. I'll create the same thing on this next sprocket. P for project. I'll click on this plane, I'll project in this, and when I project it, I automatically get the center. Great. L for line, I'm going to hover along until it should snap to right there. Now I like to create the line out of place. I'll click once here and we're done. Then I'll use the coincident constraint and I'll click this line once and this point once. By doing that, I guarantee that I'm using the constraint to snap that line to, and it's not accidentally doing something that might be uh, inadvertent or not what I intended. Then sketch point, and same sort of mentality. I'm gonna create a point way out here, further out than I want. D for dimension, and I'll dimension the distance between these two, and then I'll type in the point 01. So we're doing a, a line that's 10 thou outside of that. Back in the cam side of things, on that drill, under geometry, the whole mode is not the normal selected faces, but rather selected points. I've chosen that point just once. Now this would be a pain in the butt if you had to pick each one of the points, but luckily we don't have to because you click add to new pattern, choose a circular pattern, and picking any of these bores will automatically add it to 
the pattern that we've already made here where we've got 45 instances and you're done. Awesome. For all of you that are screaming at your monitor saying lower the retract plane, first piece of low hanging fruit that could speed up further production of these. In other words, we don't need the drill to retract or lift up nearly that high as it's moving between holes. With our holes out of the way, 2D adaptive, max RPMs 5100, two thousandths of an inch feed per tooth or 30 inches per minute. Optimal load, it looks like a funny number, but it's a good fusion 360 trick, which is if something looks like an oddly specific value, right click, and choose edit expression. What you'll see here is it's actually a formula. In this case, Daniel typed in the tool diameter and then 25% load. So it's a 25% width of cut. One way to take that even further, NYC CNC fusion expressions. We've got a list here of the most common Fusion 360 cam parameters and expressions. And the reason we made this list, uh, shout out to Rob Lockwood and some others on the forum that originally compiled this, um, is we told, pulled some of the ones that we use the most at the top because there's a very funny uh, case sensitivity and underscore nomenclature to these. So tool diameter, we could copy that, paste that in, and that's a much smarter, more intelligent way to maintain our 25% tool diameter width of cut. After that, stepping down to a quarter inch tool to do the adaptive in the center bore. Because we had already drilled that center hole with a quarter inch twist drill, I suspect he stepped down to a quarter inch tool so that way we could plunge straight into it. And sure enough, if we edit the adaptive, the last tab linking the pre-drill position, he has a point chosen, and that will save you a fair amount of time by plunging that tool straight down at your plunge feed rate, rather than having to spend the time to do a helical interpolation into that area. After that, doing some 2D contours to clean things up. Again, if you're new to machining or you're new to Fusion 360, the adaptive strategies are great strategies, but they are not finishing strategies. They will intentionally create facets along your parts because they're roughing strategies. So you wanna use those 2D contours to clean up to get good surface finishes and accurate parts. The last 2D contour is walking around the outside of the parts. And you can see this is a little bit of an unusual cut here because we're kind of plunging in and out of material, but I'm okay with that. You can use the simulation to make sure it doesn't look like you're gonna be overloading that tool. And that's why we've also chosen multiple finishing passes of 20 thousandths of an inch so that the first pass is gonna get rid of all that extra stock left over from the drilling. And the second pass will come in and really do that cleanup work. After that, a quick chamfer and we're ready to flip. Again, using the super glue technique, we've got some dowel pins. I think I misspoke earlier. They were using dowel pins, not screws, to align that part. We need that alignment because we're going to do a backside chamfer. Opening up those bores now to their final dimension of 259. We don't need them to be a quarter inch anymore. We've already used the dowel pin feature to locate them, and then finally doing that backside chamfer. Daniel then reassembled that sprocket on his mini bike gave it a quick test and it worked great. But to me, what I love is that confidence. You have to make parts. If you wanna learn how to be a machinist and you wanna learn how to machine parts, you've gotta make parts. You can do a ton of practice in fusion and that's a great thing, but there's still no shortage of the experience and the confidence gained by doing so. Folks, I hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you next Wednesday.